Right. Bonjour, je suis Philip Shaw et vous écoutez le podcast Agricole de Québec. Dans les podcasts agricoles à la vie, comme à l'école, on se parle de bricoles, de choses anticoles. On se parle de tracteurs, y'a les fans, puis les menteurs, on se lève de bonne humeur, puis on Avec Christian Dion. Hey, hey, salut tout le monde. J'espère que vous allez bien. Christian Dion pour les podcasts agricoles du Québec. Euh, hey, Aujourd'hui, euh, j'ai appelé des renforts parce qu'on va faire un podcast en anglais. Puis je, vu que je ne suis pas très, très bon en anglais, ben, j'ai demandé des renforts à Sylvain Leroux puis à Jean-Philippe Boucher. Euh, merci beaucoup d'avoir accepté mon invitation de, de me donner un coup de main. Ça fait plaisir, mon cher. Pareillement, fait plaisir. Good. Euh, C'est ça, à soir, on reçoit Philippe Chat. Hein, Philippe Chat qui est un, un producteur de l'Ontario. Si vous êtes sur Twitter, c'est sûr que vous avez déjà vu passer un de ses tweets, surtout si vous êtes agriculteur. Euh, Quelqu'un qu'on qu 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 connaît depuis longtemps, mais qu'on va essayer d'approfondir un petit peu plus à soir. Le connaître un peu plus. C'est pour ça, euh, je vais essayer d'en dire un petit peu en anglais, mais je ne suis vraiment pas terrible. Puis... <rire> C'est le meilleur faire... que tu penses, c'est pas mal bon. Ah, oh, en tout cas, j'ai vraiment pas, pas la bon. chance de pratiquer souvent, il faut, faut être honnête aussi. Là. Donc, euh... hi, Mr. Shaw. Bonjour, Christian. Comment oui. allez-vous? Yeah, very fine. And you? I'm good, I'm good tonight. Très bon. Right. Um, tonight, I, I, we want to, to know who is Philip Shaw. Uh, where from? Um, and all, the, all of your background in, in agriculture. You have a very impressive, uh, impressive. Uh, impressive. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm not laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, first of all, uh, you, um, where, where, uh, where are you from? Well, uh, merci Christian. And, uh... Uh, greetings to the audience in Quebec. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure and a privilege as a unilingual English speaking uh, farmer from Ontario to speak to all my friends in Quebec tonight, which I have many. <laughs> and, and I have a long history in Quebec, uh, one of the, such a wonderful uh, place to be from where Quebec farmers feel what it's like to be a Quebec farmer because they feel it in their soul. And I've had lots of opportunity to be in Quebec over my whole career. Uh, and I hope to come back someday. Hopefully we can get this COVID pandemic behind us, but I am from here. This is my farm. These are my soybeans that you see growing over my shoulders. I am from Southwestern Ontario. Uh, Dresden, Ontario, which is close to Windsor, Ontario, close to Detroit, Michigan, and uh, in the far deep south of Ontario, where I farm uh, for a living. But of course, I, I do quite a few other things uh, through the years. Um, I uh, went to the University of Guelph and I studied there in agricultural economics, did a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Uh, in uh, agricultural economics. And that's where I met a good Quebec friend of mine who eventually turned out to be the Dean of Agriculture at Laval University. His name was André Gasselin, who farmed strawberries at Ile d'Orléans uh, in Quebec City. And I spent lots of time on his strawberry farm. Uh, but after that, I kept farming and buying land. And, And then I started writing a column called Under the Agrodome 35 years ago, an agricultural economic column, which was eventually picked up by DTN, Data Transmission Network, an American company 
in the United States. And so I still write for them uh, every week across the United States and Canada. But I did that 30 years ago on a satellite network. And uh, eventually I was picked up by the Ontario farmer here in Ontario. And eventually over the years, I was asked to write agricultural commodity commentary uh, on agricultural prices and markets for the Ontario Corn Producers Association which eventually that changed to the Grain Farmers of Ontario where I write agricultural commentary or, or mostly market commentary on prices of grain in Ontario and even in Quebec to some extent uh, because there's quite a grain trade across, across our border with Quebec. And, um, you know, I did many other things <laughs> through the years too, continued to farm and I do a podcast in Bangladesh with a friend. I lecture in Bangladesh often. Uh, I like to get to Asia as much as I can. I also used to write farm machinery reviews. So we love Jean-Philippe Boucher in Quebec because he's such a great market analyst. But uh, I used to do the same thing, but I would review tractors and combines at the same time. <laughs> and I really enjoyed that. Uh, but uh, that changed over the years. I don't do that anymore. And I even had a professional basketball commentary on the radio here in southwestern Ontario at one time. So there's, um, you know, I'm 63 years old now. I used to be a young man doing all this. And it wasn't always easy. There was lots of criticism as I, as I grew into this and continues to be. Um, but I have a keen interest in agricultural markets, especially in eastern Canada. I don't really have an affinity for Western Canadian markets because I don't try to talk about some things that I don't know. Uh, it's been incredibly fascinating to learn more about Quebec markets and maritime Canada markets as well, because I've done a lot of speaking uh, on markets across Eastern Canada, well, Western Canada too, and the United States. And uh, so that just gives you a little bit of my background. Like I say, I mainly farm for a living, and these soybeans I try to get to, these are from last year. And as we all know, grain markets in Quebec and Ontario and all around the world can't get enough of what we grow. And uh, so it's made for a very, very uh, interesting time for all of us. And um, I know in my own career, these times we're nearing record price levels on the futures market. So, you know, there's much perspective to talk about. Uh, there's much going on in Quebec and Ontario with regard to price discovery and grain markets. And it continues to evolve. And we're at a very interesting point right at this time because of the tragedy that we see in Ukraine and how that's affecting markets now. But anyway, we could get into that maybe a little bit later. But that gives you a little background on me, Christian. And uh, I guess I even write in Quebec for Grain Whiz. Grain Whiz. Uh, Jean-Philippe Boucher gave me the opportunity several years ago to write a monthly column for him. And I've been doing that and he's been translating that for several years now uh, where I try to um, reach out uh, in what in my writing to Quebec producers and, and uh, in French and speak to what concerns them with regard mostly to, uh, to grain markets. And uh, so I've been in Quebec uh, several times. I've spoken in Quebec, I think about four times, three times, I think for Grain Whiz, once for the UPA. And of course, if you've seen my Twitter feed, you saw that I even led uh, a big protest there in 2006 six with UPA members right behind me in Parliament Hill. I think, Christian, you were with me there that day. Yes, and, yes. Yes, and, and uh, the UPA, the Quebec farmers, marched in from Hull across the bridge, and we had 10,000 farmers in Ottawa that day. And I did the English part of it with Pierre Rion, who many Quebec farmers would know because he's a legend in Quebec. I knew of him and uh, we, got to, we got to know each other. So, I mean, there's lots to talk about. <laughs> there's lots to talk about. And of course, I, I've known Sylvain on Twitter for quite some time. 
Um, we chatted. Philip. Philip. Yeah. Um, at the, in, the, in 2006, at Ottawa. Um, in Ontario, at this time, you have, uh, if I remember, three associations in the grain. You have the Ontario grain producer, the Ontario soybean producer, and Ontario wheat producer. Uh, now is the uh, is Ontario grain producer. You have um, merged all the little association. Oui, oui. And uh, Christian, if you're more comfortable asking these questions in French, just ask them in French, and I'm sure we'll get. <laughs> we'll sure we'll understand each other somehow. Somebody will be able to help. Uh, yes. I have a personal uh, producer, uh, Philippe and Jean, uh, Jean, uh, Sylvain and Jean Philippe. <laughs> oui. uh, like in Ontario, um, we used to have organizations that were separate. We had the Ontario Wheat Producers Organization uh, Marketing Board. We had the Ontario Corn Producers Marketing Association, and before that, we had the Ontario Soybean Marketing Board. But there was the thought that in Ontario. Uh, many of us were members of each organization and and like for instance myself I grow wheat corn and soybeans and so there was a thought to join all the organizations together in Ontario and so that's what we did uh, several years back now I can't remember actually when that happened but when I started I was writing about corn prices only uh, I was asked to do that uh, by the Ontario corn producers and I was asked to continue to write agricultural market commentary by the Grain Farmers Ontario. So the Grain Farmers Ontario represent uh, all the grain farmers in Ontario now, and they have relationships in Quebec with your organizations as well. And, and uh, you know, in Eastern Canada, we try to work together as much as we can. Just for a count. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> you know, <laughs> just for a comparison. Um, with uh, the, the tree association, oui. do you have to pay uh, a membership at the H association? No. No? No. There's no because longer. Here, here, uh, the there's no can. longer. There's no longer three associations. It's only one. That's it's a, no, you no, meant, you meant at the time. At the time of the three associations and uh, board, did you have to be part of each of them to market grants? Yeah. Or? Yeah. At that time, there was check off there was money going to each association but now it's only to the grain farmers ontario based on so much uh grain that is uh, marketed in ontario and that's how it works now and do you pay um here here in quebec we pay um cotisation sylvain check off à l'upo oui. and uh, we pay on each ton of grain we oui. sell oui. um, one under uh, one hundred. Well, a dollar, a dollar forty-two or a dollar thirty-nine per ton. Yeah, ben, ouais, une trente pour le maïs, puis une quarante pour toutes les autres grains. Ouais. Right. Uh, what, what Christian wants to like he, here in Quebec, there's the uh, the the UPA, which is the general organization for all members and all producers, and there's one fee for that, and there's another one that is per ton or per grain uh, marketed uh, fee there too. Like, is it, he was just wondering if it's the same, if you have check no, off for each no, or it's, it's, a, it's not the same that way. In the UPA, I have, I have spoken in Montreal at the headquarters of the UPA. I had quite a relationship earlier in my career. We always looked at the UPA as being uh, the model organization that we wanted in Ontario, but uh, so I know how the funding is done for UPA in Quebec. In Ontario, it is not done that way. There are three, at least three general farm organizations. Uh, one is the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. We have the National Farmers Union of Ontario, as well as the Christian Farmers Organization, Christian Farmers Federation of Ontario. And producers choose which one they want to support every year. Okay with the Ontario Federation of Agriculture being the largest. Yeah. Just continue without me. I will see my little boy. Okay. 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 It, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, for instance, they they don't have the same relationship 
the Ontario General Farm Organizations have with the commodity or the Grain Farmers Ontario as the UPA does with the hmm. uh, grain organizations in Quebec. Now it's all under one roof here in Quebec, which that's correct. And it's not, an it is a strength when you want to get together to, to, to make some demands and do some uh, very important discussions with governments, but also in between producers, sometimes it kind of a few clashes happens, but that's the way it is. I well, was wondering, uh, like he, we 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 went on the uh, farmers uh, organization pretty quick. I was wondering, like prior to get to that point, what uh, like you you were born on on a farm and uh, you you got into university, you did a master's, and then went even further, did a bachelor. Like why? But he, was the economic part of farming very important to you, or were you just like really good with numbers to get? So no, far, I always felt that I always felt that uh, it was actually my father that uh, counseled me to go to university. Um, I was wasn't interested in crop science, and I'm still not interested in agricultural science and crop science and things of that nature. I was interested in agricultural economics. Okay, and. I was very interested in that. I just felt that anything else from an agricultural science perspective, I could I could pick that up in a book or now you can pick it up on a web page or something. But I always felt management on the farm was very important. So if I could manage the numbers, uh, that would be a good uh, thing to know. Little did I know that by taking agricultural economics, it gave me the basis for understanding how supply and demand works and how price discovery works within, within agricultural markets. So I, I took that at Guelph early. I went back and I farmed full time for five years and I bought land and farms during that time. Then I went back and did a master's degree in agricultural economics and business where I did, um, I concentrated on market research at that point and I actually um, measured farmers' psychographics across Canada. And you know what demographics is, age, income, and education. Well, I measured farmers' attitudes, interests, and opinions across Canada and published my thesis, which was Dimensions of Canadian Agriculture. Oh. And the UPA actually published my questionnaire in French to all the people on the UPA list at that time, which was 1988, long time ago now. And I was able to categorize French Canadian farmers, Quebec farmers on how they felt about the world and how they felt about life and how they felt about buying agricultural inputs and markets and things of that nature. So that's what my master's thesis was about. And it gave me the background to, to um, to interpret markets and economic, uh, how economics works. And so when I try to um, look at modern day events and how it affects markets, that's all working in the background. And so on the farm, I typically look at a problem. I, I tend to look at it from an economic standpoint almost all the time. How is this going to pay me back? How is this, how is the marginal revenue going to be greater than the marginal cost when I make farm decisions. Uh, you know, so, so that was the background I had and that's where, that's what I was lucky enough to do. I never felt that I was as smart as any of the other graduate students. I obviously had good enough marks to get in, but I just felt that I could, I worked hard and that's what I still do. You know, planting these soybeans, that's hard work, but I have no trouble with doing that. And, uh, you know, through hard work that, you know, you can make up for anything else that uh, you might not be so good at. But, but uh, you know, Sylvain, you know me. We, we've, we've known each other for quite some time. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's just a case of being open-minded and working hard and trying to be and using the tools that you have to interpret uh, the things around you. 
and all those studies got you to where you end up in life and being able to to study and understand economics on all levels and marketing so that's basically what got you to the uh the, the level of knowledge that you have now and then we all look at uh, <laughs> right now. well it's been helpful uh however everything that i do i've been asked to do okay so like for instance Grain Farmers of Ontario asked me to interpret markets for them and to, to do that. Uh, all the other publications and and organizations I write for have done the same thing, as well as I, I well, before COVID, I would speak in public a lot. I haven't done that during COVID. I've done it virtually. I don't really prefer virtual because, like, for instance, when I come to Quebec, I, I really enjoy meeting the people and hearing their stories and learning more about what is what drives a Quebec farmer and uh, you know I think that Quebec agriculture is is so important and Quebec farmers are so important but trying to understand what motivates Quebec farmers is incredibly interesting and your economic even your marketing system is different for hogs versus what it is here in Ontario your price discovery uh of grain is different than what it is for me uh and the movement of grain and different things so yes um um i'm asked to do what i what i do but i and new and and computer technology has really helped me with that because even back in the old days when i was speaking in quebec for the work i did for the upa i was using fax modems and computers to help me do the work and it's the same thing that I do today because what you see behind me with these soybeans, that's what I do. That's my farm and 10 miles toward the sun is Michigan, USA. And, you know, I farm 860 acres of land and I do it basically by myself. My brother helps me transfer grain in the fall. Um, but this, the other things I've been asked to do and that's, and I'm, I'm paid well for them and that's important to me you know, if, if, if there's an opportunity, I try to take it and, um, you, you know, but I have the background and if, if I, if, if people aren't satisfied, <laughs> obviously I don't, and I will no longer be asked to do that, but I try to remain relevant to the market and to, uh, the farmers that may or may not listen to me and not everybody does. And that's okay. That's the nature of our business. Il a tu gelé? Non, 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 non. Il attend une question ou quelque chose. OK, je pensais qu'il ne bougeait plus. Ah. <rire> il ne bougeait plus pendant tout. Bon, là, tu étais rendu, dans le fond, à l'école. Tu as parlé de l'école, Sylvain? Oui. OK. Well, what, what about the background behind it? Like, because, like, I, I was just curious, Philip, like, how many generations of your family have been, like, uh, producing in your area? Like, is it you is it your father your grandfather well i am a fifth generation canadian so i know in quebec you would have uh, canadians and quebecers that go back much farther than me for instance my friends in ile d'orleans they go back to the 1600s in in quebec um but for myself my great great grandfather landed, I think, in uh, the Montreal area in 1837, and he actually walked down to southwestern Ontario. And he died in 1880, and he, he farmed south of Dresden, Ontario, where I'm from. And he had 17 children. And, you know, at that time in 1880, there wasn't much else to do, I guess. So he had 17 children. And you know, so most people with the last name of Shock relate back to him in this area, but there were, he came from Northern Ireland at the time. And uh, my, and so then my great grandfather farmed after him to some extent, but farming was different then, as you know, it was more like a subsistence type of thing. There was a local economy and they had livestock and things. And my grandfather I farmed and, uh, one of the farms that I farm now, this one here, my grandfather owned that. My father bought it from him and I bought it from my father. 
and but it's been in my family since about World War II, right after World War II. Um, but keep in mind, it's not uh, Drummondville or it's not Ile d'Orléans or it's not the Beauce. It's not south of Montreal. It's in the deep southwest of Ontario. So uh, it's in an area where we don't have very much livestock. We don't have very many buildings. And it's very reminiscent of uh, the Midwest of the United States. And so that's kind of my background um, of where I came from. My wife's family is uh, originally French Canadian and uh, came from Quebec. And my wife uh, uh, speaks pretty good French. She, she thinks she does not, uh, but, but she does. And, and that's, that's, and I'm 63 years old now. So obviously at some point I'll have to decide what to do. Uh, but I'll probably keep writing uh, because, you know, farming is a, it's been a challenging life because the first interest rates that I paid on farm demand loans were 23.25%. Now, yesterday, the Bank of Canada raised their lending rate to 0.5%. And my first demand loans were 23.25%. And it was hard enough to get capital to farm at that time because the interest rates were so high. Um, so, you know, through the years, there have been challenges. And we've arrived at today where JP and I were talking about high grain prices before we came on. Um, so, you know, agriculture is constantly changing. And as farmers, the only thing that I can count on in 2022 and 2023 is more change and markets are that way as well and we have to continue to evolve with them so the land that you see behind me has been in the family for since after world war ii but my uh extended family came to the deep southwest of ontario from northern ireland landing probably in montreal and going on in about 1837. So, you know, th th that's a little bit more about me and where I came from and, and what I what I do. And uh, I do count it a privilege uh, to have many friends in Quebec and have actually had, an, had somewhat of an impact there. And because, you know, I think I've talked to Sylvain about this over the years and, and maybe even JP, that they're French, uh, French Canada and English Canada don't talk to each other very much. And it's not because we don't like each other. We do like each other, but we just don't have an opportunity to do that because of the language barrier. But any time that I've been in Quebec, I've always tried to sit with people that didn't understand very much English. And I certainly don't understand much French, but we always got along fine and we learned lots from each other. And it's been a very good thing. Um, when you're first generation at your farms uh, arrive, um, what you do? Uh, milk cow, uh, uh, grow corn, or? I don't know, Christian. Okay. Je ne sais pas. I don't know. The, you know, that was so long ago. I, I never, of course, never knew, you know, at that time in the, in the deep southwest of Ontario, These trees that you see here, it would have been forested area, and it probably would have been more of a subsistence agriculture where you just fed your family. Um, over a period of time, like these soybeans that you see are all exported to Asia now, just like a lot of non-GMO soybeans in Quebec are exported to Asia. So in the deep southwest of Ontario, where I'm from, we have the longest growing season of anywhere in Canada. So we grow a lot of tomatoes here, seed corn, um, uh, sugar beets, uh, a lot of grain crops were grown here years ago before they were grown in Quebec. And, uh, and now it has evolved into my farm where uh, all my soybeans go to Asia. And of course my corn, I don't grow a lot of corn. I'm not a big corn grower, but uh, you know, a third of that goes to ethanol here in Ontario and similar to what it was well, in Quebec. We don't have much of a feed market here in the deep southwest of Ontario, not like you do in Quebec where it's a very dynamic thing. Plus you're closer to exports, but yeah. 
and <clears throat> your um, your area is it's a uh, comment on pourrait dire ça maraîcher uh, yeah it's more like uh, you guys like it's a very uh, horticulture type of production in, in, well there is the there, 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 the tomatoes are produced here we we grow a lot of tomatoes in the deep southwest of ontario and when i say the deep southwest i mainly mean chatham kent and essex near windsor and lambton counties near sarnia we're the most farther south in the province and that that has given us a climate where tomato production can thrive and also seed corn is grown here for instance some of the seed corn that you grow in quebec would be grown here and it's because of the climate we have which is much 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 warmer than you have in quebec and and you know we grow much longer heat unit corn and, and things of that nature so uh is there Horticulture adaptation, there is certainly some of that, but we don't really consider tomatoes horticulture, <laughs> you know, and cucumbers and, and, and things of that nature. There are fruit crops as well, uh, not quite like Niagara, but we grow peaches here as well. We grow peaches here as well. And for instance, uh, uh, my Quebec colleague uh, that I studied with who went on to be the dean at Laval, uh, he did a lot of his work uh, Uh, he has greenhouses all over Quebec now, but he did a lot of his early work in Leamington uh, in the southern part of the deep southwest of Ontario. And uh, so, you know, it is a unique area, but maybe not as unique as it once was because uh, there's corn grown all into New Brunswick now uh, versus a time when it was mainly centered down at this down this way. Um, but uh, it, it, it is uh, an, an interesting area. We also have French Canadian populations here where French is spoken. And, uh, you know, so, so it's a very unique area. But, but if you think about it, think about it in terms of we have more heat than almost anywhere else in Ontario and Quebec. And because of that, we tend to grow bigger yields, especially on corn. And, and so, so you, that's what it's like here. And of course, it's culturally different than Quebec. It's culturally different than the rest of Ontario. But uh, even within Quebec, there's differences. So, yeah. You know. And uh, you have a well, tomato producer in your area. But do you buy, again, uh, Ains ketchup for your home? <laughs> it's interesting because it's interesting because um, Heinz shut down their plant in the deep southwest of Ontario a couple of years ago, and I was I've written quite a bit about that because with the Canadian dollar the way it is, that uh, tomato production is very profitable in southwestern Ontario. It was more a corporate decision from Warren Buffett at that time to shut down the Heinz plant in Leamington. And so I went into the grocery store that day and I wanted to buy some ketchup. And I said to the grocer, I do not want Heinz ketchup because they shut down the plant in Leamington, Ontario. And the person just looked at me rather strangely. And, you know, I got a got lots of Heinz ketchup for you to buy here. And I said, I don't want it. I want to buy Canadian ketchup. And um, so as you know, there was pushback on social media about that to some extent. And uh, the Heinz plant in Leamington was sold to uh, a, a group of, of investors who now produce uh, processed tomato products again. Now it's very controversial here because they have not agreed to, uh, they've broken up the collective marketing system for tomato pricing in this area. And so uh, they produce different vegetable products, different tomato products, um, but Heinz, the Heinz plant is gone. So to answer your question, no, I prefer not to, uh, to use Heinz ketchup because of some of the 
problems that they caused in southwestern Ontario. Um, but but the bigger story about that is the marketing for tomatoes. The collective bargaining process was actually broken up because of of that. Uh, and it's a typical view. It's just like what JP would talk about in Quebec. Uh, if you're buying corn in Quebec, you want it as cheap as you can buy it. And if you're selling corn, you want it as expensive as you can sell it. Um, in Ontario, the tomato processors wanted it cheaper than they were getting it. And they were actually able to do that. Uh, to get cheaper tomatoes because some growers uh, agreed to do that. I wouldn't say it's been totally a success story because as you all know, probably you can grow more profit growing corn now in Southwestern Ontario with less risk than you can tomatoes. Even though tomatoes were an extremely profitable crop where you would gross maybe $3,000 an acre or more but the cost to grow them was very high. And uh, so, you know, the reality in the marketplace now is that grain is a lot less risk and the price it's at is better than some of the horticultural crops that we have. So the adjustments that were made in the marketing process in tomatoes at this time are kind of a, uh, have served as a problem. But it's interesting because it used to be like, for instance, in Quebec, and I'm not sure, but I would assume that some of the supply managed uh, sectors within the province have driven the land prices to some extent. They certainly have in Ontario, but where I'm from in the deep Southwest of Ontario, tomato production was the, driver of land prices for a long, long time because it was the most profitable crop to grow. And it typically was the best land. And, you know, that's changed to some extent now because we all know what land prices have done. I'm not sure what farmland is selling for in Quebec, but it's very expensive in some parts of Ontario at prices that I could have never dreamt of. Not really reflective of the productive value of the land, but it is what it is. So, I hope that answers your question, Christian, of whether I use Heinz ketchup or not. It's a complicated answer. <laughs> Great. Um, we have uh, Jean-Philippe, I have to quit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> un gros merci, Jean-Philippe, de ta participation. Fait que, on... Uh, on se reprend n'importe quand. Je suis vraiment désolé. J'avais avait vraiment juste une heure ce soir. Uh, C'est toujours un plaisir d'être pour uh, des podcasts. Philippe, it's always a pleasure. I really need to leave. I just had an hour tonight. Uh, but uh, we'll catch it eventually, that's for sure. And I'll try to find a another way of inviting you again in Quebec. Pleasure to discuss with you. So That would be fun, fun. yes. Yeah. Yes. Salut, always. monsieur. Salut. Have a Merci good beaucoup. podcast. Bye. OK. Excuse-moi, Sylvain. C'est pas ça que je voulais faire. <rire> C'était Jean-Philippe que je voulais comme, euh, effacer. Puis finalement, il est parti avant que je clique. Bon. Great. Um, Philippe, in your area, in Ontario, Do you sell your corn in metric tons or in bushel? Because here we we use uh, metric tons. Yeah. The truck go on the big balance and uh, oui. and that's it. Oui. The answer to your question is very depending where you are in Ontario. Where I am from, we sell and we buy and we think in bushels. That's the price of, you know, that's how we quote prices. About Highway 400 in Ontario, if you go north of Toronto, the Highway 400 goes from Toronto to Barrie. And east of Highway 400, grain is priced in metric tons all the way east into Quebec and New Brunswick. <laughs> and I don't know why other than It might have been more of a livestock application in the early days where 
grain was uh, bought in tons to feed the livestock. But where I'm from, in southwestern Ontario, it was, and it's still quoted in bushels. And when I speak in Quebec or when I go into eastern Ontario, I usually need to um, update myself on how much grain is worth per ton because I don't think about that. America, here in Quebec, we mix two systems. Okay. Um, for the yield in the corn or oui. in soybean, oui. it's metric tons by acres. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the metric system and the English system. Right. Right. But we, um, in my case, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm okay to metric, metric, full metric, ton oui. by oui. hectare. Uh, comment on dit ça, hectare en anglais, Sylvain? Hectares. Hectares? Yeah. No, it, we're, we're pretty funny that way in Quebec. I mean, you probably know, Philip, but it's uh, usually we'll do uh, uh, our uh, yields in uh, metric tons over acres. Uh, we'll do our uh, pesticides applications on liters per acres. Yes. yes. Uh, it, it's uh, some, somewhat confusing, but more and more producers, like younger generations now are more like matrix to matrix. It's getting there with technology. Kind of, it's very hard to mix, but they still, they do. Like com uh, combines can give us like volume over area in matrix ton and area over acres. But it's uh, like you guys are mainly bushels. That's how things are measured in the area. Uh, well, mainly. One, of the reasons, one of the reasons we're bushels is because 10 miles to the west of us in the United States, it's all bushels. And that grain comes across the border and goes back. And, you know, the volumes are great. And so I think that's why it was that way. But I've noticed in Quebec, Um, and in Ontario, I've noticed this as well. The younger people, half my age or so, are more adept at working in metric tons and metric volumes. I work in liters per acre as well. Uh, but I, I just, I, you know, some of these things, younger people in Quebec and younger people in Ontario, uh, temperature is the big one too. You see, I'm so close to the Americans that I listen to Detroit Michigan weather reports for my farm and all the temperatures are in Fahrenheit and of course uh, Well, I can operate in Celsius, but younger people never even think about Fahrenheit Temperatures while a person like me. I grew up that way so, for, for me I, the Fahrenheit is good for a pool and the barbecue Wait, wait, wait <laughs> And well, how, how far are you from the American border, Christian? And how far are you? So uh, two hour of road. Okay. Yeah, about the same. Like the okay. closest uh, American border is uh, would be uh, New York State for us. Yes. Something yes. like that. Vermont. Yes. So still, I have to go across uh, Montreal. Yeah. And, uh, uh, La Col, tu traverses à Champlain, New York. And of course, we haven't been crossing that border very much because of the testing that's required for COVID. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that'll change soon so we can make it a little bit, hopefully COVID becomes over with so we can go down there a little easier. But uh, crossing the American border here is, 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 you know, before COVID, it was very normal to do that for almost anything, right? And, uh, you know, I imagine that in Quebec, Uh, Christian, maybe you, your family went, or did you ever go to Lake Champlain for a weekend, or no. New York? No? <laughs> yeah. I thought there was a very popular beach in Lake Champlain. A lot of Montrealers went down. Montrealers, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. But we're yeah. too busy in the summer to do that. Yep. So, yes. uh, anyway, you know, the relationship between uh the american side and down here has always been uh, very similar like a, a lot of people would say that they can't tell the difference between me and somebody that lives in michigan um but anyway that's just that's just canadians all across the uh close to the border may 
reflect like that. But uh, yeah, so but there, there's nobody as unique as Quebecers within Canada, uh, you know, and I always uh, appreciate my Quebec uh, contacts and what they tell me. Um, in your area near Dresden, <laughs> how much for one acre of land? Well, the tomato problem. land that grows tomatoes, you know, some of it is sold for $22,000 an acre for some of the best land. That is less than land sold in other parts of Ontario that isn't as good and doesn't have as much heat. I think there's even been some land sell for $25,000, but that's the very best land. There's lots of land for sale here that would sell for $12,000 an acre or maybe $15,000 an acre for heavier clay land. Maybe it's a little bit less than that. I'm not sure. That's just what I've heard. And of course, that's much higher um, than it used to be. Um, land in the Oxford County area, wood, near Woodstock, Ontario, and of course, closer to the greater Toronto area, is much higher than that. I do not know what the price of land is in St. Hyacinth or or the, in the Montreal area. You 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 guys could tell me how much. Yeah, uh, per acre uh, in my area, we're close to twelve twelve thousand. Okay. Um, there's some that were priced even higher than that. Like you see, anything that is surrounding any suburban area goes for a lot more. Okay. Because of even though if even though in Quebec we do have a law that prevents uh, buildings or development for residential areas on farmland being zoned farmland, still there's a lot of people who are buying it in the forecast of maybe one day seeing that uh, restriction being lifted. Uh, okay. I don't know, Christian, you guys are. Quoi comme prix à peu près dans les mêmes 12 15 000 dollars à quoi 11 000 12 000 dollars peut facile oui, oui. puis euh, en location j'ai entendu parler de pas loin de 400 là dans mon coin lapin lauk 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 see like we're we're very uh, like we're talking um, in uh, three three different measurements uh, arpa, arpa. I forget what it is in English. It's yeah. the old French. Why? Well, I guess it's French. French. Okay. okay. They still use that acres and hectares. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, Christian, um, are you near Drummondville? Yes. Okay. Uh, about uh, 25 minutes from, from Drummondville. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Um, He's not far from the St. Lawrence River. Like uh, some of his land is even in the uh, in the uh, low level. That's it's not the only non dam in part. Oui, the mid Yeah, uh, ben, aux abords du lac Saint Pierre. Yeah, he's uh, right near the uh, lac Saint Pierre uh, area. Okay. So he's got uh, he's got good land. I find it interesting. I don't know if you fellows follow André St. Pierre on Twitter. Yes. I know Sylvain does, but his uh, farm is. Oh, my goodness. Uh, André, André is a uh, Rimouski. Wait. Well, it's past it's, Rimouski, isn't it? It's very, 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 very far. It's on far, the north side. Away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on the north yeah. side? Yeah. Uh, no, the, the South Banks. Wait. Okay. Oh, and, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's you know, uh, he he has beautiful pictures that he posts from St. Lawrence, and uh, uh, you know that's very far north. André is on the border of 132, right. au Bic, avant d'arriver à Rimouski un peu. Ouais, c'est ça. Ouais. Pour être chez eux, j'ai déjà été moi. Euh... Uh, how uh, about the land? How about the land south of Montreal? Land south of Montreal toward the border. How much is it? How much is land trading for there? How much is land? C'est en haut de vin. Okay. Why? Ouais, j'ai pas de j'ai pas de, de valeur exacte. Là. Um, don't. Well, Christian mentions maybe something like twenty twenty thousand an okay. acre. 
but it's it, like any anywhere else it varies and there's a lot of land in those areas that are suitable for many other crops like when uh, wine yards uh, uh, some of them might be worth a little more and how about in the boats how about in the boats boats um i don't know je connais pas personne dans ce coin là toi dans boats tu as tu des aucune idée des prix à la boats Bose is known for its maple syrup, and yes, there's some uh, animal production, pig, pig and animal. And how about uh, Lake Saint Jean? Like, I don't know. Je sais pas Lake Saint Jean prix des terres. It's not even close to what Montreal or any other suburban area. Oh, I know, but they have quite a few dairy farms up there. Yeah, it's yeah, it's uh, highly uh, animal production, yeah. although. In some of the area, Robert, uh, Robertville, uh, Robertval, uh, it's getting more and more cash crop. Okay. They, they are doing uh, canola, uh, cereals, uh, some corn, but canola being the price it is, some of them are just amazing. And yeah. it gets better and better at what they're doing, so getting good yields too. <laughs> yes, yes. In Ontario, do you have some uh, program for to um, install a boundary vren? Okay, he wants to know, like, on the environmental protection programs, you guys in Ontario, do you have anything? We, we are getting restricted, but we are getting some programs on the federal level. There are some in the uh, growing forward program, stuff like that. He was wondering in Ontario, where are you guys at? In those no, that regard, no. um, in terms of restrictions, um, there, there are really no particular government restrictions. There's certainly recommendations and and things like that to lower phosphate uh, impact on the Great Lakes. I wait to see my, my, my little boy. Okay. Okay. Uh, there, there's certainly some restrictions on our. There's not the restrictions that you refer to in Quebec. Okay. Uh, you know, the, that may come. Um, but, uh, like, for instance, how, how much restrictions is there for hog manure in Quebec? I don't know the exact limitations. It, it, it's basically per animal uh, phosphorus production. Like, how okay. many how many phosphorus you're allowed to to export or apply. And this yeah. is all by... Uh, Yeah, by and by a fertilizer program online. Yeah. Like if your phosphorus levels are too high, you can't apply uh, yeah. above such level. Yeah, we, we have similar type things as, as that, um, but not too much else. Now there has been um, there's been talk of of increased regulation regarding fertilizer use and things like that. But of course, that was before the realities that we have with the war going on now yeah. in Ukraine and the way prices have gone. So I do not know. I, I do not know exactly. Uh, that's more of a political question. And I try to stay away from politics. Uh, I enjoy reading about it, but I don't really have much of an opinion politically uh, yeah. other than to treat people properly. So with regard to, with regard to environmental regulation, Uh, I think that's more of a political uh, question in Ontario, and the Ontario Ontario Premier Doug, Mr. Ford, is is not big on that, except for the fact that uh, protecting the Great Lakes and fresh water in Ontario uh, uh, would be a big thing. And with regard to hog production and and things of that nature, it's probably. Uh, almost or almost as restrictive as it would be in Quebec because you have similar issues with regard to protecting the lakes and the water. There's a lot a lot of demand here uh, from the public to be more responsible yes. on, the, on, on those on those subjects. But in, right. in Ontario, so there's no uh, incentives or are there? I, I, I think I remember U.S. having some programs to help or keep or enroll land yeah. in renewable uh, or uh, regenerative programs keep land grassland and stuff like that there's there, anywhere in your area anyway that, that there, there have been incentives through the years but they've been more of a um, 
I was going to say hodgepodge. I don't know how you translate that into French, but it's, it, it, it hasn't really been too organized through the years. Uh, there has been times where you're paid for residue to leave on the land. Mm -hmm. There's also, there are different government programs that you can get involved in to change equipment and, and do a few things, but they're very, they're not funded very well. Uh, you know, so, so nothing too onerous as of yet, but we'll see how that goes in the future. Uh, of course, we, we pay the same, I guess you would pay a little different carbon tax than we do. Uh, but that's an ongoing thing to to reduce carbon in in agriculture, and and so there's there's programs with regard to try to help with that, but nothing too onerous so far. But that might change. Politics again. Yes, there's a lot of that, and uh, but I, you know I, I've always felt in Quebec, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but in Quebec. Rennie Levesque said that, you know, if you pay taxes and you live in Quebec, you are a Quebecer. And at one time he said, if we wanted to be, if we want our own country, we have to learn how to feed ourselves. So, you know, Quebec always had a much more, uh, a much richer agricultural policy. And I don't mean necessarily economically. It, it just tended to be much more well thought out. And it tended to be much more about Quebecers than in Ontario, where it wasn't necessarily about us. It was about cheap food. <laughs> and and uh, so there are differences there. Yeah. Uh, Philippe, the name Agridome, where, how, how this name is born? The Agridome, the name of the Agridome came uh, from a place in New Zealand. And uh, early on, when I was a very young person, there used to be a agricultural television show in Windsor, Ontario, and it was called Agriscope. That was the name of the show, Agriscope. And the host of the show used to say, this week, under the Agriscope, we are putting this issue on the show. And he would say, under the agriscope. So when I visited New Zealand in 1984, I went to a place called the Agridome, which is a agricultural show near Rotorua, New Zealand. It's a, basically a show for sheep. It's a sheep show. <laughs> And they have a large structure called the Agridome. So when I started my column over 35 years ago, I named it under the agrodome as I would put agricultural issues underneath this facade of the agrodome uh, to look at every week. And so that's where the name agrodome came from. And uh, when I started on Twitter about 12 years ago, that's the name I took and that's what my column's called. And I don't think it's, I don't think, Lots of people that read my writing would probably not know that because I write market trends for the Grain Farmers of Ontario and I write other commentary for other companies and it's just my byline, just my name. But that's where Agridome comes from. That's the story why that word is what it is. And um, there are others that go by that name or try to go by that name. Um, but they're very small. They're, they don't have the following that I do. But that's where it came from. It came from New Zealand originally. And if you go to New Zealand, <laughs> you can actually visit the Agridome in a place called Rotorua, New Zealand on the North Island. And I've been there a couple of <laughs> times. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and about it, you, you say this, uh, you were on Twitter from uh, 12 years ago. And, yeah, I think it was 2009, and that's probably where I met both of you. And I was not uh, on then. I'm I sorry? came on. I came on in 15. Okay, well, you know, I remember you very clearly, Sylvain, because uh, you would comment to me from time to time. But our 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 interactions was always very pleasant. Um, but I think at that time I, I commented a lot more on Twitter. I seem to try to answer everybody. I don't try to answer anybody anymore. It's just too hard. Um, but, but yeah, I started in 2009 and at that time, 
the story was I was writing for the Grain Farmers of Ontario, I believe at the time, and the editor of Grain Farmers of Ontario wanted to see me at a meeting. She wanted to see me. And that was a bit unusual because a lot of my editors, I really don't know. So I got to the meeting and she came toward me and she was a very young, attractive, uh, 20 something year old female editor, uh, from Newfoundland. And, uh, we sat down and had a chat and she said to me, and I'm much older than her. And she said to me, I want you on Twitter. And I knew a little bit about Twitter. And I said, I don't want to be on Twitter. I don't want to follow anybody. I don't want anybody following me. And she looked back at me. And she said that she found Twitter very useful and that she found out a lot of things on Twitter. And she said, Phil, if you want to be a real pro, you got to be on Twitter. And so I looked back at her and I said, okay, I'll go home and I'll get on Twitter. So this, you know, think of this, this is a young 20 something young lady telling me, if you want to be a real pro, you got to be on Twitter. So I went home, I got on Twitter that night and within five minutes of being on Twitter, I realized how useful it was to me because I could put all of my work on Twitter and people could read it, or I could make comment on Twitter and people would read it. And if I put good content on Twitter, people might follow me. And for the most part, not all, but for the most part, it was a very positive experience of making friends and meeting people. Both of you, I've had dinner with both of you, okay? in, in uh, Drummondville a few years ago. Uh, I've known you for several years. We don't speak the same language except we're friends and and we get along fine. But, but without Twitter, we would not know each other, okay? Yeah. And so on Twitter, I believe we make friends first. Uh, however, I do find it, it, it was a tremendous, at that time, it was a tremendous way to to gather information and and put information out there uh, and learn from different people and like for instance with my writing about markets and about agriculture i have friends all over the world in brazil in argentina in the ukraine in russia in sweden in europe in australia in new zealand in quebec in Saskatchewan, in the United States, everywhere, that tell me what's going on in their world. And I found that very useful, and I found it very, um, very it's a very dynamic place to be. Now, there was negatives as well. Uh, there was negatives, but the way I got around that was uh, I make Twitter lists, and I've got, I think I follow about 4,600 people on Twitter, but there's no way I can follow that many. So I have specific lists of people that I look at every day and I mainly follow the lists. And it'd be, it makes Twitter a very powerful medium. So I find it very useful. I've noticed through the years though, that I think maybe some people do not, but I find it very useful. And it's a way to make friends. And, uh, and now you can translate, so I can translate any language, whether that's Bengali, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, French, English, whatever, I can translate. I got letters, or not letters, I got email from people in South America that were trying to speak to me in Spanish and English in the early days of Twitter because they were so interested to know somebody that knew something about grain prices in North America and how that might relate to South America. But now on Twitter, I like, for instance, if Christian um, tweets and or either one of you tweet in French or you're talking to each other, the technology is there for me to get an idea of what you're talking about. It might not be perfect. And it's the same thing with you. If, if, if I'm speaking to somebody in English, you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. At the same point, if we went to China, 
and we had our smartphone and we were using something like Google Translate, we could have the merchant speak to our phone and they translate the Chinese into French or English and we could read what they wanted. So these technologies have really helped connect the world. And uh, with regard to Twitter, that's how it all started with me, with a young person telling me to get on, to be a real pro. And, and she was right. You, you know, she was right. And uh, that's the way I've met you. That's the way I've met JP. Uh, some of you may know Elena Neroba, who is a Ukrainian drain, grain trader. Some of you might follow her. Well, you know, I've talked to her during this terrible time in Ukraine, right? She invited me to speak virtually in Ukraine last year. And so, you know, if you use it correctly, it's a very valuable thing. And uh, it might not quite be what it used to be, but I find it very powerful for me and, and, and very useful, very useful. And, you know, I'm hoping to visit both of you on your farm someday. You know, I hope to. I think that's a beautiful pictures both of you got behind you. And I hope you can come here as well, yeah, because likewise. on Twitter we make friends, right? And and I mean, some of the, some of the people we meet on Twitter don't seem too friendly. <laughs> but, but you know, I don't get that. But uh, uh, but we also learn and uh, learn about markets, learn about agriculture, learn about like Christian, for instance. Christian has a lot of different machinery I like looking at that he uses. And I, I, you know, don't often know where you're doing it, but I enjoy watching some of the things you're doing. And I try to understand. And, and you know, so Twitter is, has been a vehicle for me to, uh, to reach out. And, you know, I publish a podcast from our video cast, a YouTube channel from Bangladesh on global issues uh, that I talk to. I've got a large Bangladeshi following of people in Bangladesh, and I go there often to to do things. And so, I mean, it's been a great way to reach out. And that's what I love from uh, Twitter. You know how the the farming is work in Illinois, uh, say right. in the many places. Right. Right. I've seen the in Illinois or here, uh, the Illinois don't plant Two weeks before us yeah yeah <laughs> uh, we plant corn at the same time no yeah, yeah and that uh, that that's what i love from twitter yeah. uh, i follow um uh most uh, from ag agriculture on twitter mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. i i want to learn about mm -hmm. the different place in the world Do you ever talk to French farmers in France? Yes, yes. Boy. I follow uh, a lot right. of a French farmer from France. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and of course, we don't have to speak the same language. I got asked the other day, do you understand Arabic? And I said, no. But I translate it through the software, and I understand. And so that's very powerful. Yeah, the, the translate button on the be uh, at the bottom of the tweet, though. It helps. It helps. It helps. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> like, for instance, uh, I have a lot of Bangladesh friends, and they tweet in Bengali, which is a different a different script. It's a totally different letters, but it just translates, and I know what they're talking about. You know. You you have. Um... Um, a great relation, great relation with Bangladesh. Oui. Um, do you tell us about the agriculture of Bangladesh? Well, the way that started when I did my master's degree in agricultural economics, I became friends with uh, a fellow by the name of Enamel Hawk. Enamel was a fellow doing his master's degree and PhD at the University of Guelph where I was. And I, he, I invited him down to my farm and we became great friends. And through the years where we remained friends, he went on to do his PhD in resource economics. And now he's a professor at East West University in Dhaka, Bangladesh. 
but we did everything together for years and we continue to do it. And now with technology, we, um, I talk to him all the time. Um, and we even went to Quebec, uh, Quebec city together back in the days. And there's a quite a famous picture we took in front of the UPA headquarters with UPA people. And, and anyway, but I've been back to Bangladesh seven times since then, uh, visiting him and going throughout the country. It's a country, when I first went there in 1993, there was 92 million people there. It's a country the size of a little bit bigger than New Brunswick. Now there's 160 million people there. It's a country with gross domestic product uh, increases of, um, or economic growth increases of about 8% per year. So over a period of 30 years that I've been there, I've seen poverty decrease. And you can see that tangibly on the street that people aren't as poor as they once were. They managed to feed themselves in that country. Well, they import some food, but they managed to feed themselves. So they grow a lot of rice to feed a large domestic market, 160 million people. That's right beside India, which has 1.3 million people. When you think about Indian agriculture, think about the large domestic market to consume agricultural commodities, food. It's just huge, and Bangladesh is the same. You know, in Quebec and Ontario, we think about producing corn, using some of it for animal feed and ethanol, and then exporting it out. Hopefully, we can export the corn. Well, it's because we're small. We're a small country compared to other countries. Well, other countries have huge domestic markets, and Bangladesh is like that. So they grow an awful lot of rice, which they feed their population. But of course, they grow everything else as well. Uh, a lot of oil seed, whether it's sunflowers or rapeseed or canola. Uh, but most of it is consumed uh, right there. But the poverty, the the country is getting richer and richer and richer and richer, and poverty is going down. And uh, so, you know, when I'm there, there's a larger middle class now. And uh, I walk in the fields, I go out into the fields and I actually talk to the farmers. Generally, we don't talk the same language, but I have translators. And, you know, it's a very interesting to me. Uh, and it's all because of the friend I met at the University of Guelph many, many years ago. And you can go to YouTube and you can watch us. We Once a month, we talk about global issues. And this month, we're talking about social media versus legacy media and who is telling the truth. We have a long discussion, you know. And of course, when you and I watch the newscasts about Ukraine, we always wonder, well, what is the truth there? Because in war, the first casualty of war is truth. So. So, you know, that's a little bit about Bangladesh. Uh, I hope to get back there again someday. It's a lot easier to fly there now than it used to be. And uh, it's given me more of a global perspective uh, when I think about these things and how the world works. Um, but uh, because, you know, it's a big world out there and and not everything operates like it does here in Ontario and Quebec. And it's interesting to look about, certainly interesting to visit. Okay. And in the past, you have uh, made some podcast. Yes. Uh, before, the podca uh, before the podcast was popular, like, Yes. <laughs> like now, okay. <laughs> yes. I had a podcast for many years. I, I, I used to be on the radio here. Uh, I did radio commentary for seven years in Chatham, Ontario. Every week I had a radio commentary where I talked about agricultural economics and markets. I, had, I did that for seven years until that came to an end. And, after, and during that time, I podcasted that every week. And it was on Apple Podcasts. But that would be 20 years ago when I did that. So, <laughs> so that was before podcasts were very popular. And uh, I still do one. You can go to the Grain Farmers of Ontario website. And you can click on Markets and Market Trends. And you can listen to a monthly podcast that I do. Well, it's 14 times a year. 
that I do on grain markets. You can listen to me podcasting that. And I, I also do the video cast from Bangladesh. I even did a professional basketball podcast uh, for one year for a company. Uh, and I don't do that anymore either. So, so, you know, I've had quite a bit of podcasting experience through the years. Um, and I still do it, but I don't do my personal one that I used to do. Um, my wife, uh, actually, uh, got cancer back in 2014 and luckily she survived that. Um, but, uh, at that time I had to throw things out of the, I had to stop doing so much because I had to take care of her and she's much, she's all better, but we were lucky because you don't always survive those things. Uh, but I had to stop it at that time. Uh, I could do it again, but I mean, Chris Jen, you know how much work it is to do and it's, you know, computers help, but it's still, you have a schedule to meet and, and, uh, I think my podcasting days from a personal standpoint are over. But I, like I say, I, I still do it for the Grain Farmers of Ontario 14 times a year. Um, do you was, uh, do, uh, do you add the president of the Grain Farmer on, of Ontario in the past? Okay, you're going to have to help me out. Uh, I know the chairman of the Grain Farmers of Ontario. Est-ce que déjà t'es le président, mettons, des producteurs de grains d'Ontario? I was wondering, uh, in your in your eight days of uh, grain producer, uh, were you ever on the board of the grain no. corn or president of any of the organization? Even in I was I was vice president of some local organizations at the time, many many years ago. Um, however, I never aspired to. Um, how should I say this? I never aspired to be part of a member organization. I am a member of the Grain Farmers of Ontario and, and I help sell, you know, I, I help sell memberships when the original membership drive was going years ago, but I, I, I never did that. However, as you know, in 2006, we had a large protest on Parliament Hill where farmers came together. And I was asked to lead that the English part of that by the many farm groups in Ontario for whatever reason, maybe it was because I was, I, um, could speak in public, who knows, but I was asked to do that. So I did, I have led, I have led farmers before, and, and that was a, an example of that, but no, uh, I, uh, I support the local and the provincial organizations that, that, uh, that represent farmers in Ontario, but, uh, I've never had the motivation to lead more than that. Politics is something that I find interesting to think about, but I really have no interest in, in politics other than just thinking about it and, and reading a little bit about it. <laughs> and, you know, if you're involved in farm organizations, a large part of that is at a certain level, as you get into leadership is about politics and we've got good people in Ontario to do that. They don't need me to do it. I'd be glad to help. And I suppose I did back in 2006 when I led protests. Um, but, uh, no, I, I don't see myself, uh, being part of that. I, I try to support the many people that, that do. Demande donc, <coughs> Sylvain, si il euh, y a de la relève chez eux. Uh, Christian wants to know, um, you are the fifth generation on the farm. Is there going to be, or do you have any uh, sixth generation uh, working their way up? That's uh, yet to be determined. It doesn't, uh, it's yet to be determined at this point. Uh, I haven't, uh, I haven't, uh, 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 haven't got those plans made yet. It's something that is on my mind. I actually don't talk about it very much. And the reason I don't is because a few years ago, I wrote a column about growing older on the farm and as you farm. And the next thing I knew, almost everybody was asking about buying my land or, or they thought I was going to retire or something. All kinds of rumors started. And I just thought, I'll never write that column again. <laughs> so, so, uh, 
Uh, that's yet to be determined. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, I'm 63 years old now, but I used to be a young man in my 20s when this all started. And you know, I I often say that, well, physically I'm not what I used to be, but I'm a lot smarter. I'm as smart as I used to be now. With regard to as smart decisions on the farm type of thing, but with regard to farming, both of you gentlemen are younger than me, and you are farming very successfully, and I know both of you, and I see you farm. But as you grow older, it can become more dangerous, okay? Mm -hmm. So the important thing is to farm, but farm safely. And as you grow older, you have to be more cognizant of your own particular uh, safety. And it becomes a little bit more difficult as you grow older. So I'm very cognizant of that. And I'll have to retire at some point in the future. Uh, but that's yet to, deter to determine how that's going to work. Okay. And I'm working on that at the present time. Uh, also, too, when you, when you have a, a large public forum like I do, because people know me in Ontario, especially in rural areas, uh, because of my background and of writing and you know speaking through the years i i just tend to keep my private life somewhat private you know you you guys both know me i don't talk about family on twitter or anything like that yeah. simply because in the past there's been some issues uh with uh with people that that uh you know you don't need to you you, you don't need to uh at least the way I felt about it is, is that I don't talk about those things because they don't need to be known. <laughs> you know, you, I've got a personal life and a business life, and that's what that's how I separate it. And it, it's just, it's just better that way. Um, it's just better that way. So, uh, yeah, obviously, I won't be able to continue into perpetuity in the future, but I haven't yet to figure out how that's going to uh, transition into something else. So, but uh, it's something that's top drawer right now. That's for sure. And it's it's similar everywhere. Like there's there's no uh, there's no uh, set point in time for retirement, and there's no guarantee for a continuum in in, in the farm uh, in in many 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 cases. So it's yeah, it's not just in your or mine or I don't know about Christian, yeah, but anyway, it's a yeah, it's a private matter that needs needs to be addressed at the right time too early and not too late. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that it's evolving as well the, with the high price of land and equipment. Uh, there's going to have to be some uh, innovative arrangements. And yep. I'm not exactly sure what that will be. Exactly. How do you see the future of agriculture in Canada? Huh? <laughs> That's tough a big question. question. <laughs> tough question. Um, we haven't talked much about the price of grain tonight, but I wrote a column a few weeks ago. Well, it'd be a month or two ago now. Yeah. And I talked about the market wanting almost anything we have now. And you can see that, whether it's corn, wheat, soybeans, canola or livestock yeah this market wants more than we can give it right now <clears throat> and frankly in my career i've never seen this before and that's a long career and i've seen a lot <laughs> you know we're used to if there's a demand for something usually supply fills that up and we get it but I bet you both of you are waiting on something now, whether it's equipment that you bought or parts that you need or something that you, a new truck that you'd like or something that you're waiting because there's supply constraints. The supply needs to catch up to the demand that is there. And so when you look at the future of Canadian agriculture, it's hard to paint it in a negative sense right now because I have never seen demand for things so high where supply has not caught up for it. The, you know, I, I, I frankly have never seen it. And I've been around, I've been doing this 40 years, you know, and 
in my position, usually you feel that you should have a good grasp of the future. But I can honestly say that I did not anticipate how low interest rates would affect Canadian agriculture. And the way low interest rates affected Canadian agriculture is, is that it made capital much more available for expansion during the last 10 years. Somebody like myself had to borrow money at much higher uh, costs, and it seemed to take forever to get out from under that, get out from under the debt load. However, we've transitioned into an, an agricultural economy where the idea of debt did not matter as much. And in fact, paying off the debt did not matter as much. So I can honestly say that I missed that as an agricultural economist or as a farmer. Uh, like all my friends, maybe including both of you, think that I should work harder and buy more land and keep working. Um, but I missed that, and, and but we're still there. We're still there. And I remember my father said to me, long before he passed, he said to me, how, how do you know that land will not be $10,000 an acre someday? And of course, I remember looking at him like thinking, my goodness, you know, land's $5,000 an acre. Why would it ever be 10? It's hard for me to imagine. But now we're over twice that here, right? So you ask a good question, Christian. You ask a good question. Like... You, you, you know, it would seem like the future is very bright based on the demand for the agricultural commodities that we have. But keep in mind the reality in Canada and in Quebec is different than other countries. For instance, in the last three years, in the United States, the government injected $31 billion into farmers' pockets. based on the crops that they grow, which are the same crops that all three of us grow. At the same time, all three of us did not get anything like that, okay? So there's different realities for, for different countries, but you and I have to compete against that, our American friends. And we like our American friends, but you know, part of the pent up demand for things had to do with the capital that was put in the US agricultural economy. So is there a future for Canadian agriculture? Well, yes, I think there is, but we're going into this with our eyes wide open because the Canadian government and the Quebec government will probably not support Canadian farmers and Quebec farmers as well as our American friends will and others in Europe and other places. So, you know, the future can be bright for Canadian agriculture, but you have to uh, do a better job than me of having a vision for what that might be and be right about it. Be right about it. You'll also need an awful lot of money, an awful lot of capital to make it work. And frankly, I just, I just have a hard time figuring out how that is going to work. Um, maybe it means that farms just continually get bigger, like all three of us talk to our friends in Western Canada from time to time. And they have huge farms, huge farms, you know, like there's one fellow we talked to on Twitter. He's very uh, critical of, of uh, Mr. Trudeau, but he farms about 13,000 acres, you know, and there's another fellow out West. I know that I talked to on Twitter. He farms about 70,000 acres, 70,000 acres. So there's differences all across our country and the economic realities are different for each one of us. And uh, so, and the realities are different depending on how governments treats us as well. And I, I do think that we, our Canadian agricultural policy needs some work and, and because our country is so diverse that uh, Marie-Claude Bobo from Quebec, the agriculture minister has many different demands on her and it's difficult for her to get a comprehensive agricultural policy, something that we we're demanding back in 2000, 2006. So I don't know if that answers the question that you asked me, <clears throat> because 
unless you're in the business, uh, there might be opportunities for you in support levels in agriculture, but in terms of farming, it's going to take a lot of capital and, and, and to remain in this business over a period of time. Great. <laughs> that, uh, uh, it's what a, a tough question. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now, um, Philip, I will, uh, will this end this podcast? Well, uh, let me thank you. Merci uh, beaucoup. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it is certainly a pleasure and an honor and a privilege to be able to speak <clears throat> in my own language to my French Canadian partners and friends and farmers all across Quebec. Uh, I feel honored to be asked. And I've always felt honored every time I've gone to Quebec to speak there and to, to, to learn from Quebec farmers and listen to them and what they're thinking. It's one of the most unique places uh, in Canada to go to learn about Canadian agriculture. And I, I just love it. And I can't wait to get back one of these days. Great. And uh, the honor is for us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, accept this invitation. Um, it's the first podcast in English for me. Uh, <laughs> You did well, and, really well. And you have a lot of experience in podcasts, you. But uh, may I begin? Uh, it's uh, it's my first year. Uh, mm -hmm. I have made a one year uh, complete. Right. You've done very well. Done very well. Yeah, great. Uh, Sylvain, un oui. gros merci de, de m'avoir aidé. Écoute, je ne suis, suis pas un expert en anglais, mais quand j'avais de la misère, là, tu étais... C'était d'une aide là, euh, vraiment très, très, très appréciée. C'est un privilège, Christian, d'avoir pris part à cette expérience. Euh, beaucoup de respect pour, pour ce que tu fais, puis euh, autant pour Philippe, euh, que j'apprécie je, je, énormément. C'est un plaisir, mon cher ami. Good. Un gros merci à tous d'avoir été à l'écoute jusqu'à la fin. Puis encore une fois, un gros merci à M. Philippe Shaw de Dresden, en Ontario. Donc, sur ce, je vous dis à la prochaine. Merci beaucoup. Bye-bye tout le monde.